Welcome to another week of the Behavior Evolution and Culture Seminar Series. Um, the brand new Beck website is now up and running, so if you haven't seen it already, please um, head to it for a schedule of the rest of the talks for this winter quarter. Um, I want to announce one additional talk that's happening. Um, it's uh, a lecture by Professor Rob Boyd, who's here at UCLA, um, titled How Culture Transformed Human Evolution. And that's going to be um, in the Leonard Auditorium in the Fowler Museum on Wednesday, this, uh, sorry, next Wednesday, January 19th at 7 p.m. Um, I think you can get more information on that from the, on the Beck website. Is that right? I don't think there's anything on the website right now, but we'll put something up and it'll be, I'll send out another notice for the list. Okay. And there are flyers all over this building if you want more information. So, um, and the answer to part of the Okay, and it's on the other website. Um, next week is uh, a holiday, so there will not be a Beck talk, um, so just be aware of that. Um, and then without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Bruce Winterholder, who is a professor of anthropology at UC Davis. He's also a member of the graduate group in ecology, and it, um, also is the associate dean of the social sciences at Davis. He's going to be talking today about behavioral ecology models of habitat infill and the evolution of prehistoric despotism. Despotism. Sorry. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was actually here to give one of these talks about three or four years ago. I've been trying to remember how long. And at that time, was talking about hunter gatherers and, and basically the. The upshot of the talk was to try to convince people that if you were a forager, even if you had the option to become something else, you were best off remaining a forager. That is, the, the evolution away from foraging was, I'm, just turns, I'm so keen to turn off cell phones. There. So I was giving this talk several years ago on foragers and trying to convince people that uh, it was difficult for foragers to evolve into agriculturalists and horticulturists because there are a wide variety of reasons you would want to stay a forager. Now, this talk, I'm trying to do something else. I'm actually um, focusing more on how it is that systems and societies move away from being egalitarian foragers of the kind of Kung Slan model and why we end up with very hierarchical despotic societies in a number of prehistoric cases, both for foragers in some cases and, of course, more commonly for agriculturalists. So, first of all, appreciations to Brooke and everyone. And the problem, what I want to do here is, is try to show you or, or try to test the model of how population growth and infill over a variety of habitats to occur if we make a couple of simple assumptions. Those assumptions are that the, the habitat's different in their suitability. The suitability of the habitat changes as a function of population density in the habitat. Uh, most commonly it declines, but it might also uh, increase. And we allow individuals to settle in the best habitat available to them. We assume they're completely knowledgeable about these habitats and they have freedom to move. It's some of the simplifying assumptions. Now, those are the assumptions of what behavioral ecologists call the ideal free distribution. And it produces some hypotheses, some predictions. And I'm going to test those with the data set from the northern Channel Islands off the coast of Santa Barbara, just north of here. Beyond that, though, I'm also interested in the kind of social and political evolution of this system and conceivably others in prehistory. And I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about the evolution then of social stratification and despotism and show you some modeling results about that as well. So the simple model here, the test of the assumptions that I just mentioned is the idea of redistribution, and the idea here is that if we can rank a series of habitats, A, B, C here, by some measure of their suitability, we would expect the population to enter habitat A first because it's the best one, and as population grows in that habitat, it declines. And when the marginal suitability of that habitat is equal to the next available habitat in this rank, then population growth will occur in both of them, and the 
if you add a third one, you eventually will get population growth in fill in all of them. And the total population, if this kind of process is occurring, is going to fill up those habitats something like this. A is going to grow until point one here. Then growth is going to be divided between A and B. Point two, growth is going to be divided amongst A, B, and C. And in fact, C ends up with the largest population because it has the, the greatest resilience to the absorption of, of population. That's the simplest form of this model. For human beings, we can actually make it quite a lot more interesting by adding something called the Lee effect. This is due to W.C. Lee, who um, in the 1940s argued that at very low densities, there actually was a positive density dependence to filling a habitat with population, because it became easier to find mates and avoid predators. And with humans, you can think of all kinds of things like economies of scale and the acquisition of resources and defense of resources, storage, and so forth. So in this case, you would have a positive effect on the suitability of the habitat as low numbers of individuals inhabit it. And in C, I've shown that to an exaggerated degree. And then you get these kind of interesting things where population starts to fill habitat A, but when, when there's a marginal spillover to B, it's accelerating in its suitability so much as you add individuals that it actually draws population out of habitat A resettle in B, and then again, the same thing happens here with habitat C, but to a, to a greater extent. And the interesting thing about these models, a Lee or, or a non-Ali effect in them, is that you can play around with the shapes of these curves and the relative position and generate all kinds of uh, ideas about how, uh, for instance, humans might have migrated across the Pacific or filled up habitats in North America during the, the settlement process here, and so forth. Okay, the test of this then, in work with some of the archaeologists you saw acknowledged on the introductory scheme, Jacob Hartruff and Doug Cannon at the University of Oregon, is on the Northern Channel Islands, off the coast of Santa Barbara and Hapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel. Santa Barbara coastline is about 40 kilometers to the right here in this slide. We're looking uh, to the west, uh, out into the Pacific. <clears throat> this data set has some, some great advantages for this kind of work. One is that these channel, the Channel Islands here are national parks, so there's not a lot of disturbance due to construction. Another one is that pocket gophers never migrated into these islands, so you get these beautiful stratified sequences of archaeological material, not kind of all churned up by gophers digging burrows around and mixing things up. And finally, um, the University of California, Santa Barbara is right there, so there's been an awful lot of uh, archaeological work done out there. Nearly 13,000 year record of uh, archaeological presence on these islands. Now, the sequence here is these, these islands were visited by human beings as early as about 13,000 years ago, maybe 13,500. There's actually human bone dated out there at 13,500. They were settled uh, with permanent village locations where you find large middens and, and cemeteries and other evidence of pretty stable uh, seasonal settlement as early as 8,000 years ago. And that was probably by, uh, at least initially, a small group, 30 to 50 hunter-gatherers. We presume they're relatively egalitarian, like most hunter-gatherers. And then over the ensuing seven to 8,000 years, they fill in these habitats, and they evolve one of the more complex social structures for hunter-gatherer groups known historically. So this is the scene at, at 1542 when the Spanish first uh, happened by here. There were about 3,000 people living on the islands. They, they were living in uh, what we know from ethno-historic sources, these named settlements. There are a variety of, of sizes, then about 20. Uh, 21, 22 communities. 
Uh, there were chiefs in some of them. Some of them had multiple chiefs. Some of those chiefs were women. Uh, there was an active shell bead economy, a, a kind of a, a market exchange system going on here, and a rank society with hereditary, hereditary leaders. So the, the, the issue here is then how do we get from 30 to 50 hunter gatherers to something like this? Now, the specific hypotheses that I'm going to test here come right straight out of, at least for this part of the talk, that uh, ideal free distribution. First one is that locations, we'll call them habitats, will be settled in descending order of their suitability. That as soon as one is settled, it continues to be settled as new sites are added. Number three uh, is kind of hard to test with this data set because it's making an assumption about marginal trade-offs. Uh, but number four, we'll see a little bit of data on and I'll talk more about um, later, and that is marginal suitability in all settled habitats affects all individuals equally. And then that marginal suitability declines as the population grows, and there's also some evidence of that. <coughs> um, we're examining permanent village settlements here. They're typically at the mouths of drainages, as I will show you in a few minutes. And we're going to make the assumption that the resource base associated with that community is the watershed, is the drainage. And there's, there's evidence and, and rationales for that archaeologically, but I'm going to leave that aside for a moment. So. <clears throat> Testing the does the ideal free distribution work in this case requires that we uh, somehow rank the potential sites for archaeological settlement on these <coughs> islands. And we've done it this way. This is a GIS database. Based on kind of ethnohistoric and archaeological and, and ethnographic information about these peoples, we decided that one resource would be the size of the watershed, and that has to do with the terrestrial resources there. But it also has to do with the, the potential of year-round stream flow at the mouth of that watershed. These are dry islands. Water is uh, scarce out there. We then looked at the beach line and categorized it in, in three categories. Rocky headlands, uh, which is just cliffs plunging into the sea, which have very little use for human beings there. Rocky intertidal zone, which is a very rich shellfish gathering area, and Sandy Beach, which does not provide many food resources, but is a source of the shell that was eventually used for the currencies that were in play in the late prehistoric. And it's, it's good for pulling out your uh, canoe, your boat. You'd like to have a little stretch of sandy beach to make that easy. This is, this is not an easy place to be a seafarer, by the way. It's pretty difficult. And then finally, kelp bed offshore. And these are, are very rich zones for uh, marine mammals and, and fisheries if you have these kelp beds off the mouth of your habitat. So if we're looking at a site that's located right here, then we take the area. This is a, a large drainage, a lot of good kelp bed within a two-mile buffer radius of the site. And in this case, most of the shoreline is either intertidal zone or sandy beach. This would be a great place to live if you're going to live on the Channel Islands as a hunter-gatherer. On, on the other hand, this, this is pretty poor. There's, it's a very small drainage. Uh, it's all rocky headlands along the coast. There's no rocky intertidal for shell fishing. There's no sandy beach. There's no kelp offshore. This, this would be a miserable place to live on the, on the Channel Islands. And basically, what we did then is, in the, the first pass through this test, again, based on intuitions from the literature, we said, um, we're going to weight the area of the watershed 50%. And we're going to weight the rocky or tidal 30%, the kelp bed 15%, and sandy beach 5%. Aggregate those together and create a ranking of 46 watersheds on these islands. 
that we, we know correspond to archaeological sites, the mouths of these watersheds in many cases. And if you do that, and in this slide I'm going to show you a quartile ranking based on that, you know, one by one ranking of all those watersheds. So these are the watersheds in the first quartile of the ranking, and then the color changes would go second, third, and fourth quartile. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you in the same kind of step procedure how the archaeological picture out there develops over this seven or 8,000 years. Um, and what, what you're looking for, again, as a test of these hypotheses is to, do these sites fill up in the order of this ranking of these watersheds and are sites that are first settled continuously settled in the sequence. So in the early Holocene, the first site is right here. Uh, this is Telecote and Arlington Canyon. It's the, actually, the location of that very good site I showed you in the slide just a minute ago. By the time we come to the middle Holocene, there are about six sites out there. And notice this, this one repeats, as we'd expect. Most of these are going to be found in first rank sites. Some slip down to second rank, and we get the odd one out here that's not associated with the watershed at all. By the early part of the late Holocene, we're continuing to add sites. And note again, they start repeating uh, from earlier. But we're also picking up some found in third and occasionally fourth rank watersheds. Middle late Holocene, that, that same kind of pattern continues. And then finally, by the, the period immediately before the prehistoric, you're even picking up you know, a fair number of archaeological settlements out here in a place that's pretty poor habitat, basically, for, for human beings. This is that same, uh, same data set, but displayed in a different way to give you a different sense of it. What I've done here, don't, don't try to read these things. This is first, second, third, and fourth quartile ranking of these 46 watersheds. And we go from early Holocene through the same divisions of archaeological time I showed you earlier. And if, if our hypothesis uh, about ideal free settlement of these uh, habitats were correct, we would expect this quadrant, this triangle, to be full of points. That is, at every time period, these highly ranked sites are settled. And this triangle down here to be empty of points. And it, this is archaeology, folks. It works pretty well for uh, the ambiguities and vagaries of, of archaeological data. We do have a number of unranked locales. That's that odd one out on the point that I showed you earlier and a couple of other instances like that. So um, to at least the first order then, it, it looks like the settlement <coughs> pattern out there is following the kind of pattern we would predict from an ideal free distribution model. And we're, we're meeting our, our hypotheses. Now, <clears throat> we decided then that we, we got a close enough fit. We wanted to try to do a more refined uh, analysis of it, a little bit more analytical work on this. And that required we confront the shortcomings of the, the data, because this is, this is historical data. So we have some general problems. This is data from prehistory. We can't recreate it. There are error ranges associated with a lot of these estimates. There's a lot of radiocarbon dating going on here and so forth. We have data that's right-centered. So if we want to look, for instance, the duration of the settlement of the site, which would be an interesting variable for our problems, the, the problem with that is the Spanish got there, right? And the experiment stopped. And so duration is right-centered. Right so we focused on a variable that we called earliest settlement component. Now I want to be careful. It's not necessarily earliest settlement. It's the earliest component of a settlement for which we have a radiocarbon date. Right? And those can be a, a different. Not a lot different in this case, but they can be different. And for that, for, of our 46 watersheds, there are 29 cases 
of a watershed where there is a site and we know the earliest data component. Okay. Those, that's good clean data. There are eight where there's not been sufficient archaeological exploration to really say one way or another if there was a site there or not, and if so, what was its earliest state of settlement. And then there are another nine where we can say there was no settlement. That is, there's been sufficient archaeological exploration to kind of rule out the possibility that watershed ever, ever had a village associated with it. And our problem here is that both those that can be dated, which would produce a nice linear, you would do a nice linear regression kind of modeling, but also those that were unsettled or informative for our analysis. But we can't assign them a date of zero because they were unsettled. They're right, they're right censored. In fact, we don't know when they might have been. We just know they weren't by the time the investigation or the data gathering possibilities concluded. So we'd like to use both those kinds of information. And we did that, and here I have to nod to the statistician on the project, Mark Brody, whose name was on the beginning of this. <clears throat> Not with linear regression, which won't handle data that comes in two different kinds of categories like that, ordinal data that's a date, and data that's just the yes-no. You can't put both of those into a model of linear regression. But you can using a Bayesian technique called a Gibbs sampler. And we did that to try to fit a model where we're, we're looking at what's called an unobserved variable. This is, this, we're calling it suitability of habitat. And it is a measure of, that we're predicting has to do with how early it was settled. And then the rest of this looks a bit like a linear regression model. We have a, a weighting factor, a parameter here about, again, those four features of the environment. The, because drainage is an area, we take the log, we have a length of rocky intertidal, sandy beach, kelp forest, and an, eight, and an air term. And then, this is what the Gibbs sampler will do for us that's nice. We also have a, kind of a clause in the model here that says if suitability is below some minimum, that's going to be predicted to be an unsettled drainage, never settled. And if it's above that, it's settled and it falls back into this kind of an estimate where the earliest state of settlement would be equal to the E race to suitability. And the, the short story from this analysis is that we can fit a model. It turns out the best fit uh, doing a kind of an information criterion uh, analysis of this is a three variable model, but there are no interaction terms. And so we get an intercept. Log drainage turns out to be the feature that dominates the model. The size of the, of the drainage is what matters most. It has a fairly high weight to the beta parameter. And if you look here at what's called the credibility interval, it's, it's like a confidence interval. It doesn't touch zero, so we have some statistical confidence that's real. Rocky intertidal is, uh, has less impact. And statistically, because the, the significance interval here touches zero, crosses zero, we're not, we don't have as much confidence in that as a predictor. And Sandy Beach, interestingly, turns negative on us to about the same magnitude as Rocky Intertidal is positive. But it also is just marginally significant. So then we get a highly significant suitability threshold over over here at the end, air feature, kelp forest falls out. It turns out that kelp forest has no impact on models that we're looking at for the earliest settlement component. Now, I put down here on this last line the guesses that we used in those earlier analyses, the, the step through slide and, and so forth. And you can see we actually came reasonably close, but our quantitative model will do a lot more work for us. We put this at 50%. We overestimated Rocky Intertidal. We missed the fact that Sandy Beach was negative and the magnitude of it. And we, of course, were looking at kelp forest when it turns out it doesn't, doesn't enter this model. OK, so we can, we can fit 
uh, statistically speaking, we don't just have to eyeball the graph. We can statistically, we can fit a model and get a significant result. Now, what I want to convince you next is we didn't ignore everything else going on. Um, there are a lot of confounding factors. There are, there are a lot of things that um, should have messed up the fit. And I've just listed some of them here. For instance, we're assessing the quality of the habitat for hunter-gatherers simply by measuring its area or its length, depending on which of those features it was. And that, of course, misses all kinds of things that a hunter-gatherer on the ground would be able to see. You know, one kilometer of rocky intertidal is not the same everywhere. And we're looking at watershed area, but we're missing out on springs, we're missing out on, on lithic tool sources, we're missing out on all kinds of things. So it's a very crude measure of what probably mattered to the hunter-gatherers out there. We're only looking at four features, so we're, we're missing all those other things like defensibility of the location, or are there year-round springs, or the lithic sources. We're extrapolating backward from present day environmental conditions. And if there's been an awful lot of archaeology on these islands, there's also been an awful lot of paleoclimatology and paleoecology. And we know that the, the sea levels change, shoreline configuration change, all kinds of climatic events that change ocean currents and the distribution of sea mammals and kelp beds and so forth. That also um, is ignored in the analysis. We're assuming the resources and the habitats that we see currently or assume currently are important. We're important all the way through. That may not be true in particular. The reason kelp beds fall out of the model may be that kelp beds became important only very late, and we're estimating the earliest settlement component. Um, as we see in a few minutes, these settlements intensified the production into marine resources late in, in the sequence. We've assumed each settlement is economically autonomous. Some of them may have been hived off or related to, to others. And finally, we're, this has been a purely kind of ecological or economic analysis. And one thing I would say to you is all of those kinds of features that we ignored in the simplification should have obscured or confounded a clear signal, but we still get one. That is, the, the, the model still gives us a pretty clear fit and signal of, of what was happening in terms of the order of of settlement. So, to summarize then from this, this first part, despite this rather brash neglect of all these confounding factors, settlement ordering turns out to be fairly predictable on the islands. And we do see continuity of settlement in high rank locations as new locations are added. That doesn't mean that there was a village there permanently for 7,000 years. It just means archaeologically we can see it in every defined time interval that you can get out of the resolution of the, of the data. And I've given you two papers here where we argued and presented this data. This is one that I think got linked to the BBC site, and this is the, the much more serious one where we talk in depth about using the Gibbs sampler to uh, try to estimate something like this. Now, <clears throat> that's about the ecology and the early settlement and the use of the ideal free distribution. I want to switch now and talk a little bit more about the notion of, of despotism and how political evolution might have happened on these islands. And in this part of the talk, I'm drawing on a little bit of theory called reproductive skew theory from population biology and the ideal despotic distribution. <laughs> In the model that I showed you earlier, the ideal free distribution, we are assuming that all individuals are affected equally by the decline or the acceleration in the quality of the habitat as a function of population density. Okay, there's no differentiation. Every individual is homogeneous. The ideal despotic distribution, we assume no, some individuals are going to be able to better defend resources and they're going despotically to garner a greater share than would be available to others in this. Reproductive skew theory started out um, basically to explain why um, offspring or subordinate birds would stick around the nest and help their parents raise their one generation up sibling. And the question then fairly quickly became, 
in what circumstances do, does one individual allow itself to be exploited by another individual in terms of reproductive success or share of resources and so forth? And there's now an enormous literature on this question in biology, but I want to break it down to three fairly simple predictions, one or two of them kind of self-obvious once you've stated them, one maybe not. The first one is, what if, if a subordinate individual agrees to remain in a habitat with the dominant, and the dominant agrees to let them remain, doesn't kick them out, what affects the degree to which there can be exploitation in that relationship measured as unequal access to resources, reproductive, whatever? And the general conclusions of this literature are the obvious one. As, as it gets less and less desirable to leave, you'll stick around and tolerate more loss to the despot in the place you are. That should be fairly self-evident. Not so self-evident, if staying has economies of scale, individuals will stay longer because by sticking around, they're, they're promoting per capita production, so there's more product to divide up. The despot can get a share and the subordinate will still have some. Okay. And finally, the one I find for an anthropologist is kind of ironic, as relatedness increases, uh, a subordinate will tolerate more and more exploitation. And of course, in the strictly biological sense, that's because they're sharing in the inclusive fitness of the dominant that is exploiting them. So the idea is that, you know, exploitation starts at home. You can, you know, your relatives will tolerate more exploitation than with someone unrelated. To you. So the question becomes then, how might this kind of theory help us understand what's going on on the, on the Channel Islands? And here I'm going to switch to focusing just on the last part of the prehistoric segment, sort of after about 1400 years before present. Because this is where we see the acceleration of those features that I mentioned at the very beginning, rank society and, and so forth. So what you start to see after about 1,400 years, you see, um, first of all, some of the villages move up onto defensive elevated points. More pit houses, more formal burial grounds, differential burial, so that you're beginning to see archaeological evidence of ranking and stratification in the society. There's greater reliance, as I hinted earlier, on these uh, marine resources, more offshore fishing to get marvelous hooks and, and net weights and sinkers and, and so forth. More and more evidence of um, market exchange among the islands, between the islands and the mainland based on these Shelby currencies that have been documented for the, the Chumash and the period immediately prehistoric, uh, prehistoric to that. This is Shell uh, not yet working to be. And then a lot of evidence for movement, not only of shell beads, but of goods you know, from the mainland to the islands, amongst the islands, based on these marvelous plank canoes. And the beginning of the emergence of institutionalized social inequality. Other things happen out there. This is based on work by Pat Lambert. Uh, indicators of uh, physiological stress in the recorded in bone material, retalia and periosteal lesions begin to increase. The time scale down here, we've gone from about 3,000 up to a little bit before the, the historic. So we're looking at the last part of the sequence. Those start to grow. The stature of individuals is declining on the island in mortuary samples. Remember I said one of the predictions is the marginal suitability of this place is declining over time. This is evidence of that. Archaeological measures of the frequency of village sites, like that one I showed you earlier that's up on the point where you've got the pit houses all gathered together, a kind of a defensive position begin to grow. And with a lot of variability, there's a trend toward uh, increasing population on these islands. Probably the most dramatic effect uh, that's going on, this is again from Lambert's data, is starting about 1,300 years ago, there's this peak in the number of individuals who died from violent trauma, okay, getting their skull uh, mashed, or as in the case of this individual, having an arrow point 
uh, embedded in the, in the spine. So there are quite a few majors then. This is bow and arrow show up in this region of California about 1,500 years ago, and you start to pick up arrow points in, in these sites. So there's quite a lot of evidence then to confirm, as we would expect given the fact <coughs> this, this habitat's basically filling up, your options for leaving are getting worse and worse, and a number of other things are happening, that you would expect more and more social exploitation, and, and then measures of that exploitation, violence, and so forth. So to expand slightly on the summary that I gave you a few minutes ago, the model we're trying to put together here is that there's a slow expansion of communities into first and second ranked habitats in the early part of this 8,000 year sequence. And that's consistent with the ideal free distribution. But as things fill up, as habitat space gets to be limited, as options for leaving uh, disappear, basically, you move more towards an ideal despotic version of this model. So uh, I put in, in quotation marks here the uh, three predictions I made earlier about reproductive skew and increasing exploitation. So leaving growth less and less desirable. Well, our quantitative model tells us basically that by about 650 years ago, you've reached the point that there is the, the remaining habitats are not suitable for settlement. Even though they were censored with the appearance of the, of the Spanish, uh, the model suggests they, they just there was not enough there. It's that little tiny thing I showed you on the north coast of Santa Rosa where there's no kelp bed, there's no rocky intertidal, there's very little terrestrial habitat, so forth. So leaving grows less and less desirable. Staying has increasing economies of scale. What we see towards the end of this sequence is a number of activities coming in where social cooperation for defense of the group or for providing for food and so forth become very important. So you're starting to see defensive location of settlements. You're seeing shell bead production and, and the engagement of exchange systems. The construction of these plank canoes was based on guilds of, of craftsmen where a number of individuals had to come together to, to do this. And marine fishing involved coordinating crews and, and so forth. So there are a number of economies of scale that would allow for increasing exploitation. And then finally, this is one we're kind of working on because I don't mean to imply this necessarily in a genetic sense, but relatedness begins to increase. And what I'm thinking of here is social relatedness. You start to have kings, you start to have a uh, strong local identity with a village, with a guild that's producing canoes and, and so forth. And the general idea, and this is a thought experiment at the moment, is that despotism, intergroup competition, and so forth are going to grow along with this. The first part of the sequence, we kind of really have nailed down well with models and with empirical data. The second part is, is kind of a thought story and admittedly needs a lot more work. Now, the final thing I'm going to show you is uh, a bit of a cautionary tale about that more, more work that's needed. So we took a step back at this point. Uh, our original idea was we're going to write up a, a second paper and talk about how the ideal despotic distribution is what ends this sequence and we can explain chiefdoms and the origin of social stratification and so forth. And we started looking into the literature and discovered that there's very little modeling, very little attempt to understand the ideal despotic distribution. There's an enormous literature on the ideal free distribution, but biologists by and large haven't followed up on the despotic dis you know, angle on it. And that's maybe explicable because um, you know, human prehistory is full of a lot more despotism than uh, maybe uh, our animal societies. So with a couple of postdocs, Adrian Bell in particular, and what I'm going to show you here, and, and some others, we started trying to work out what I'm calling the population ecology of uh, population growth despotism, the ideal despotic distribution. Now, this is the, the nice, neat, what it looks like when you're going to tell the size, all the characters, and so forth version. But I want to talk through 
what's up here on the top. Very briefly, show you a result and then show you why I'm being cautious about this latter part of the tail. Um, what we envision here is two habitats. In one habitat, you have despots and subordinates. The despots are despots because they can command how much of the resources of that habitat they get relative to the subordinates. Okay, so there are two varieties of, of individual in that first habitat, despots and subordinates. The other habitat just has subordinates and they're all equal and they all get an equal share in that habitat. Okay. And the question is, how does this uh, set of two habitats fill up with population? How do individuals migrate between these two habitats and how does despotism measured here it's the ability to command resources but not prevent subordinates from leaving. And they can leave. How does that work? So we generated a, a what looks fairly simple turned out to be fairly complicated model. And it just says that the rate of population growth of subordinates in habitat one is this is a constant. C is their share of the resources. We call this a concession parameter. It's how much the despots concede to the subordinates. Times the resources there as a function of population density times the population. Okay, so basically it's just we're trying to create a growth term that responds to all these features. I'll come back to migration in just a minute. In the second habitat, you have the same thing. Subordinates can grow in density in that habitat. There's a constant. There's the resources that are available. And then it's just a function of how many of them are already there in a straightforward uh, lack of a fair situation. The despots, which are shown here as Q, who live only in the first habitat, uh, they grow by the same constant. but they get one minus C. That is, they're collecting all the resources that are produced in a habitat that they're not conceding to the subordinates. And that's elevating their rate of potential growth. This is, again, the ecological yield in that habitat, the same as up here. And then we multiply this by the number of subordinates, because they're the ones generating the income for that habitat. And of course, their population growth is proportional to their own density, and we divide it to get it back to an individual basis. Okay. Here's the, here's the kind of thing that happens as a time course on that. Start down here. We're looking at, first of all, P2 is the population of subordinates in the second, the egalitarian habitat. Um, the dark line is the number of subordinates in the first habitat, which they share with the despot, and the bottom line is the population of despots. I have to go back just a minute and explain the migration term, which I left behind. Um, what happens here is if the value of the second habitat is greater than the first habitat, then subordinates migrate from one to two, and vice versa. But notice that the value in the first habitat is affected not just by the ecological circumstances there, but by the concession. It's what part of that value the subordinates get. So this whole complicated thing down here is a switching function that basically says if C phi 1 is greater than phi 2, then there's net migration from habitat 2 to 1 and vice versa. Okay, so in a time course, here's how this looks. There's very little, we start them at a very low density, you know, one one hundredth of an individual in a habitat, so there's very little growth. Then growth starts in habitat one and two, and on the left side here, the concession parameter is 0.5, so the dominants are sharing half the resources with the subordinates. They start to grow together, and they grow to about this point when, up here in this graph, we're seeing net migration this is below the line is net migration to habitat two. Above the line, it's net migration from two back to one. So there's a, a period in which habitat two is suddenly more valuable, and net migration uh, moves in that direction. You can see its effect on the population growth here of the subordinates in habitat one. Notice that the dominants aren't affected. They continue growing because they're still claiming their 50% of the resources. 
and this eventually asymptotes out. Over here, what's happened is the concession parameter is down to 0.25, so the, the dominants are keeping 75% of the resources, conceding 25% to the subordinates. And a couple of things that are different. First of all, the population growth of both subordinates and dominants in Habitat 1 is really delayed. It takes, takes longer. It's because the dominants are seeding so few resources to the subordinates, their population numbers can't increase and feed back on the growth of the, of the dominants. So after a while, population 2 takes off. And then, in fact, the migration is from habitat 2 to 1. Even though there's, a, there's a despots in habitat 1, and even though they're conceding few resources, it's pop because the habitat 2 is declining so rapidly in its suitability, it's worthwhile for subordinates to migrate back to 1 and share space with the despot. And you see the little notch in the growth of Habitat 2, but the most dramatic impact is it pops up the number of subordinates in Habitat 1 sufficiently that the dominants begin to grow and asymptote out, but it's still, it's really a tough life in Habitat 1 if you're a subordinate. I mean, they're not growing, they're not going to grow very fast. And notice that just based on the difference in concessions, we end up with a different equilibria. Here we have more dominance than subordinates. Here they end up being about equally frequent. Now, by the way, what we find in this system is that if you're going to be a dominant, you might as well be a ruthless one because it always pays you to, to exploit pretty heavily the subordinates. It may take you a long time to grow your population, but you end up with an oligarchy, which means a lot of dominance relative to the subordinates. Okay, why am I telling you this uh, in, in sort of very abbreviated form? Well. In, in 2008, uh, Doug Kennett and I wrote a paper on the population of the Pacific and especially the, ex the very rapid expansion of peoples into the Pacific. And we made this prediction. We said, when there is greater degrees of despotism, it will drive a migration that is faster in spreading across space. And the reason is that the despot will decrease the suitability for any subordinates in the current habitat and make it more likely they'll leave for the next one, even if it's not as valuable. Right? And then that process will repeat and repeat. And since we know many of these societies were chieftains or tending in that direction, this, this is a great way to explain the uh, rapid peopling of the Pacific. Well. Um, I want you to look on the left side. This, this is a case where our ecological situation is one where there's a linear decline in the resources as the population there grows. This is our prediction, um, our published prediction about this process. That is, this axis is measuring the time to a 10% occupancy of that habitat by the subpopulation we're talking about. And the dashed line here is the population in Habitat 2, the one that's you know, receiving the migrant. And we predicted that uh, with very low concessions to subordinates, that should be relatively short. And as the concessions grow, go higher and higher, um, the departure of the founding group to the next habitat will be increasingly delayed. Well, you've probably already figured out here that the, the model produced exactly the opposite result. That is, you get 10% of the eventual equilibrium population in habitat to declining as dominant concessions go up. Now, we, we know why it happened, but I, I'm using this as a cautionary tale about getting your, your, your stories based on hypotheses too far ahead of your modeling effort. What we had focused on was the economic impact on subordinates of remaining with the dominant in that habitat. What we hadn't taken into account was the population growth consequences of despotism for subordinates and for despots. And it turns out the population consequences override the economic ones in that the growth of the subordinate or the dominant population and the subordinate population is severely retarded 
at levels of uh, high exploitation. And as a consequence, you don't build up the population in that habitat, despotic habitat, fast enough to actually hive off a founder to the next, uh, the next island down, the next habitat down. Um, There's an interesting, interesting trade-off here that we haven't started to explore yet about the evolution of oligarchies. And it says, basically, if you want to end up at equilibrium with a lot of people in your oligarchy, you really severely exploit the peasantry. But if you need to grow your oligarchy really quickly, because you're competing with other groups around you or, or other chiefdoms or other states, then you don't want to exploit them quickly, right? Because you want you want to build up your population quickly in relatively few time steps and model terms, and that means conceding a lot of resources. So your peasant population grows quickly, then you can grow your your small oligarchy. There's a question there of the uh, trade-off in that. So then, um, general conclusions for the talk are that first one we can predict. Um, with a pretty good degree of accuracy, the order of settlement of these uh, drainages on the Northern Channel Islands as a function of assessing the quality of the habitat available. And you know what we've done here is something that is um, has some problems, but a, a, I guess a, a noble pedigree going a long ways back to Wallace and everyone else. We've gone to islands to look for a simplified situation, but we're going to make a more general claim that the kind of habitat heterogeneity you see on these islands and the deep mouth of these watersheds is representative of uh, habitats in general. As you see a lot of spatial differentiation, you can rank that for suitability to human occupation. The second point I want to make is that the, there are methods out there, um, methods that if you know a really good statistician, you can get access to, that will allow us to make use of comparative data sets that, that just cannot be used for like linear regression analysis. And that's where something like the Gibbs sampler and basically these kind of Bayesian techniques come into play. We were able to draw on data represented in cases which we know there was no settlement as well as which we know there was a data settlement. And in fact, in the paper, we can then go back and remember those eight cases where we really don't know if there was a settlement or there or not. We can actually rank them by their likelihood that there was a settlement. That is how probable it is in terms of our model that if archaeologists really go look hard, they'll, they'll find something. I just said something about this third point, generalizing all landscapes are island-like or, or heterogeneous. Fourth point is reproductive skew models may help us a bit in trying to understand political evolution when habitats are filling up and are becoming circumscribed and the quality of the resource base there is declining as a consequence of competition and exploitation. But and this was my point with this last little model. This is actually an area where I think we need some more modeling effort to really understand what we're talking about in the kind of way that economics interacts with population in formulating these hypotheses. And then finally, um, a little bit of historical context. One of the things I find really pleasing about this work is, in some sense, none of it is new. because. In 1970, Robert Carnero proposed the theory of the origin of the state. He called it the circumscription model. And he, he basically said, he was an intuitive thought model, he said, if you have a series of villages and they fill up to the point that there's no place left for them to go in the landscape, then social inequality is going to emerge. And he elaborated that into warfare and, and so forth. Um, what we're doing here is is providing a more mechanistic, more model-based uh, version of what Carnot proposed, what, 40 years ago or somewhat more. Um, and that increases our ability to do things with it, like testing against archaeological data. 
and to make predictions uh, like the one I just made. We can say where archaeologists should go look for sites where they're more probable than, than otherwise. And then secondly, um, as to both are conditions of agricultural growth, which had a, a period of popularity in archaeology to help explain the sociocultural evolution and the origins of chiefdom and the state in the 70s. Um, it's also reflected in this, in that those models of the ideal free distribution, especially under Lee effects, look a lot like the kind of proposal she was making about what was called intensification. As a population fills up a habitat, what's the, the nature of the economic return and yield in that habitat? And that's basically one of those curves on the ideal free or the ideal despotic distribution. So it's, it's kind of fun to think about this as harkening back uh, into the history of uh, anthropology. I will stop there and hope there's some food like that. <laughs>